gentlemen, welcome to Journey into Comics with your hosts, Nate Phillips and Brandon Stone. I am a god, you dull creature. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, morning, night, noon, I don't know. Brando, what is it, man? Uh, it's whenever our audience is listening to this. Cool. <laughs> It's 4 a.m. and you're in your bedroom. Creepy. Anyways, um, man, how's it going, bro? Oh, it's going good, man. It's been a while. Yeah, um, it's been we- weird. We uh, kind of decided to try a new format. We're mm-hmm. going to be weekly now, but together only half the time. <laughs> I miss yeah. you already. Oh, I know, man. It's been so long. Yeah, yeah. So, uh I enjoyed your pre-order canceled episode. Um, it made me want to cancel my 2K15 pre-order. I'm not going to because I don't, I don't know. I'm just going to buy the game and then be able to like, judge it. Yeah, <laughs> did, did, you know, I'm all for you know judging stuff myself. But at, I, I know that they, you know, this is, you know, 2K's first go around. Ux is still with them, though, I believe. But so I'll. I knew it was going to be like like maybe a step back while they're trying to do new stuff. I didn't realize it was going to be that much of a step back. Yeah, just and, and I and it's funny. I was not laughing at your misfortune by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm sitting here listening to you talk on the show, and I'm like, you know, Brandon fucking loves to create the wrestlers like that. Mm-hmm. You, you and I have been creating wrestlers. You more professional and kick ass than me. Um, I make people that look kind of like people. You make people that look like their people. Um, but uh, <laughs> we've been doing this since like probably like know your role. Oh man, I've been yeah. I, um, I think I've been doing it since No Mercy. Oh shit, I forgot No Mercy. Absolutely, yeah, No Mercy came out a little bit before Know Your Role. But yeah, I've been doing it since then. And uh, when they said only twenty five slots, I mean, granted that that used to be the max back on the PlayStation Two or something like that. And so when they said, you know, it's, it's only going to be 25, and then I want to say I also heard a rumor that, you know, they're doing a more detailed edit superstar, so people who are already in the game, you can kind of edit them a little bit better. But that's going to take up a create a wrestler slot, and I'm just, I wasn't digging that at all. So what's going to happen if um, the game comes out? And by the way, I thought of something that we should implement on the next show. Hmm. You say a lot of ands. And I say a lot of ums. We've made this very obvious. So yes. what if in non-intentional ways, so like you can't be telling me a story and need to use the word and, or I can't be saying, you know, like quoting someone going, oh, and he was like, um, you know, whatever. So if we slip up and use the word, we both have to like, if I slip up and say, um, I got to do five push-ups as punishment, and then like same for you. So we're getting a workout. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it kind of helps train us not to fucking say those words that linger, because they're linger words. I think is the they are. Issue. I mean, you know, a lot for me, and I noticed that during my solo episode of free on my solo cast or whatever, my Brando cast, whatever. Um, see, now I'm gonna do yours. It's about like gra- yeah. It's about gathering my thoughts, and actually during my solo cast, I did a lot of pauses yeah but that wasn't bad they were they sounded good you know it's like very dramatic pauses it's almost like i'm it's like i have a script and i'm reading and i'm pausing (laughs) i know i I just kind of noticed it and i even mentioned it in the episode where i'm like you know what i apologize if i'm pausing too much i just realized that i was but no for for the wwe game you know if it comes out and it's pretty good I'll get it down the line. I did not think that it, even with all the other stuff they were giving me is going to be worth a hundred dollars. So I canceled that and I put it towards another one, which is Batman Arkham Knight. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now that's paid off. Essentially your pre-order for that's ready. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. It's all ready. Sweet. You gotta love that. I've only got 25 bucks down, but I've got till June. I'll pop another 50 on it. Around Christmas and then another twenty five, it'll be paid off before the game even comes out. That'll be sweet. Yeah, so. uh, for me, I did it through Amazon, so it, it won't actually come out of my account until it ships. So, well, yeah, there's that. Yeah, 
Anyway, so what's been up with you, man? I mean, my life's kind of boring with life work, you know, raking yards and leaves, 11 the leave bags, death killed me almost nearly. Um, but what's been going on in your world, brother? Well, I wish I had time to rake the, you know, to rake my yard. <laughs> I've been working too damn much. Yeah, you're on six days a week, right? Mm, well, uh, I haven't since the weekend before my anniversary because I I had last week off and then this week was supposed to be the one week off or one weekend off and then we work another two I believe yes we worked the 15th and then the, the 22nd and then we have the 29th off for Thanksgiving well, that's nice and so we have that going on but I haven't had a whole lot of time to do stuff thankfully I've been able to make some contacts and do a little bit of business, you know, because I've been, I mean, you were a comic collector, I'm a game collector. So when you're collecting at some point, you're kind of collecting stuff. Uh, I, I don't know how much you've actually met up with people like I have. I've actually been making, you know, making deals online and I'm, I'll go meet them and buy, try to buy some games. But it's like, a lot, how? It's a lot how, more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. No, it really is because, like, okay, a weird example. Uh, a guy, when I was buying Walking Dead comics, this guy who lived in, I can't remember the name of the town. I want to say it was Chicago Heights, I think, um, was like, hey, I've got these, like, six Walking Deads. It was a, No, it was a lot of 10, uh, 70 through 80 because I was needing to run, and the guy gave me a pretty good deal, like, like seven fifty a book, so you know, spent about eighty bucks. And he said, "Hey, it's going to be like twelve bucks for me to ship these, or we could meet halfway." And at first, I was like, "Yeah, we'll meet halfway. That's super smart because it's not it maybe about a ten minute drive. It's only going to cost me three dollars in gas instead of twelve dollars shipping." <laughs> and then I thought about it, and I was like, "Man, he's from Chicago Heights, and I don't quite trust that. So I'll just have him ship it, and that's much more safer." <laughs> so I leave it at that, especially with books, man. I'm not – I kind of – I trust because, you know, I won't – if I buy something off eBay, my number one thing is they got to be 100 percent or I'm not even clicking anything. Yeah. I, and and not even giving it a chance. And they can't have, like, one sale. you got to have, like, maybe 50, 75 sales. I'm going to go, okay, I can trust this guy. I can yeah. trust this guy. Yeah, there's a website that I've been looking at checking out for a little bit for games it's called 99gamers.com hmm. and i'm not sure if i've told you about this but it it is a website that essentially is for game trading only it is an alternative to an ebay where ebay the prices for games are starting to go up because um it may be this way with comics i don't know but some people think think that they get a game and they're just going to jack the price out of it because they think they have liquid gold or they you know they just think they have it all and really you know it's like they they might have a rare item or something like that but they're wanting top dollar for it and if you're a collector like me I try to get everything as cheap as possible or strike deals and eBay you really can't strike deals 99 gamers works you you sign up to the site you know and it's for free and you pay them money and they give you coins you know Mario coins People have their games posted, you know, and they said, hey, uh, you know, I've got, you know, Knights of the Old Republic for the Xbox and I want five coins for it. That's shipped. So then I pay them five coins. That's five dollars. OK, just for example. Now they have to ship the game to me. And before they can get the five coins, I have to confirm delivery. So I get it. I confirm delivery. They get the five coins, but they don't get the money. They get the coins for them to go and trade for games that they want. Oh, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah. And then, you know, and it'll, and it'll tell you how many, you know, how, how many sells they've had, how many buys they've had. It'll it, like, it'll tell you, actually, it will tell you if they failed to ship their last game for whatever reason. I mean, you know, and then it's up to you to contact them. You know, if you want to have more, more pictures of the item that you want, cause you know, they'll say, Hey, it's disc only, or it's got this amount of, you know, a uh, sticker residue on it or some case damage. You can ask to see more pictures. And then, you know, you can even work some deals with, with people if you're going to buy some multiple games off the same person. It may be cheaper, you know, to bundle them all together and ship them all together. Nice. Have you got, have you bought anything off it yet? 
not yet. I've been looking at it like, like into it. Certain circumstances for me and my collecting have, over the last couple of weeks have actually prevented that because I've got some really good deals locally. Yeah. Local deals are, like I said, the best local deal I'm going to get is if Dan or uh, Jim cut me a deal at one of the comic shops when I walk in. They're like, hey, we've got something we know you want. It hasn't hit shelves yet, and because you're a – a you know a guaranteed purchase. Do you want this for this price, which is only maybe fifty to a hundred dollars more than what they paid for it? Yeah, um, you know I've got a you know a fella down south from where I am. He's got me a couple good deals on some games, and I really want to go back down there. I just haven't had time. His store is open at certain specific hours because I think he's the only guy that works there. And so, so I've got a similar kind of guy, but I haven't met him since August, and I need to go back down. That's Chrono Trigger, dude, right? Yes, it is. Fuck yeah. So, uh, Brandon, apparently the Polar Vortex is coming. It is. And I've I'm, heard about it. <laughs> I'm really sick of winter, and it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Brace um, yourself. And yeah, winter is coming, right? Which we'll get <laughs> to that later. But, uh... So, I find it interesting. We've got this Polar Vortex on the way. And, man, does God or whatever is above us controlling us, if that's the case. Um, someone wants Henry Cavill to freeze to death because now they're filming Batman vs. Superman in Chicago <laughs> the week of the polar vortex. <laughs> Who fucking came up with that plan? Genius. Oh. November, Chicago. You fail. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's going to be chilly anyway. Oh, yeah, no, without a doubt. I mean, in the summertime, because you're on the off the lake, it can be brisk. You know, yeah. sometimes in the city in July, I need a fucking jacket. But I don't – I need, like, seven coats and four beanies to survive now, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was actually just up in, uh, you know, up in Chicago a couple weeks ago. Actually, it was last weekend, and it was cold. <laughs> it was cold. Yeah, how was your how was your Chicago? No, oh, dude, it was cool. We drove through a snowstorm on the way up. Really? <laughs> yes. It, it was it was almost a whiteout on the interstate. Oh my god, well, on sixty five? Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Holy it was it. Yeah, it wasn't sticking, but it was funny. That's wild. So because it was uh yeah hold on yeah because it was Halloween. Th- yes, it was actually, and it was Halloween. Yeah, we had. You know what? I forgot. It totally did snow on Halloween. And we had um, – my job lost power three times because of that because it was 50-mile-an-hour wind gusts plus the snow. And, uh, yeah, it was not fun, especially being in that creepy-ass old house. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you, dude. And I told – actually, I start. I kind of like buttered my boss up a little bit. We didn't even put this on our, our little list of things we should talk about, but I think we can get to some news that's uh, supernatural up by my neck of the woods here in a second. But – uh Real quick to jump back before we get into this little mini tangent we're going to do here. Batman vs. Superman is filming in Chicago. Henry Cavill floating down as Superman holding Amy Adams as Lois Lane. Um, they've Some people have some video from it. Nothing too crazy. It just, sees, it just shows the improved Superman suit because they changed it a little bit. You know, every super... Why do they do that, Brando? Every superhero has to change their outfit just a little bit. Yeah, a lot. I think it has to do with the production and, you know, some of the, um, what you call it, the people that work uh, in wardrobe. Kind of like marketing, too, because then you can yeah. sell a new toy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it probably has something to do with it as well. It's, a, it's, you know, it's, I don't really remember. I haven't really seen the movies to that extent to really realize, but have, did they ever make any subtle changes to, like, the Transformers? Oh, yeah. Every, every single every one. movie was well, yes. a different version or form or shinier or sleeker or they had you know multiple bumblebees like four or five or six you know and of course they have new transformers and everyone so that's another sell and um, yeah i want yeah i actually just to you know to add to that i did watch the some of the uh extras for the amazing spider-man 2 blu-ray and they were talking about how they wanted it to make the suit a little bit more accurate to the comic yep and because in the first movie it it actually made like, you know, this kid would have made the suit with what he had. Yeah, exactly. And so now, you know, they kind of just went a went more a little bit classical of a look to it. So it it, it doesn't bother me that much it, it, unless they start adding nipples again. <laughs> yeah, no, let's not see the rise of the nipple suits 
Um, <laughs> that's ridiculously annoying. Fucking George Clooney. Um, <laughs> Dude, so, he knows. He knows, too. Yeah, man. <laughs> He knows. So to get back to what I was going to bring up that's not on the docket, our little mini tangent we'll have here. Um, so, yeah, I'm at my job on Halloween. Power goes out a couple, three or four times, and that place is creepy. And the little area that I mainly work in, there are no windows. So when the power goes out, it's fucking dark, you know. Yeah. And, you, you know, of course, you instantly, the power goes out and you freeze for a second just like, oh, shit. Like, I'm out of my element officially. And then now here we go. So, crazy news up here. Zach from uh, Ghost Adventures has uh, took $35,000 and purchased a house in Gary, Indiana, which is right in my neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. And it seems like he got himself into some deep shit. It definitely sounds like it. Uh, I guess they were looking at making a, like a documentary about this house. Because this house has a lot of history, paranormal uh, wise. I guess they have um, what over the article that I'm reading. It says they have the police department, a local police department, has over 80 pages of official reports of of odd occurrences that have happened on this property. And they've like they've had girls with, and that creeps me out. You know, girl, the whole like you know talking in tongues and shit. Yeah. But. So, yeah, one of his crew members quit because this girl that they had lived in the house like 20 years ago came back and she started speaking in tongues at the crew. And that one of that just that event alone, which I'm sure is on film, um, was enough to have a crew member actually quit. So Zach pulls the whole production. He says, we're done. And uh, interestingly enough, he had the house exercised twice. Nothing. The girl had been exercised, and I don't know how that turned out. They didn't really update on the girl. No. But but they said they're going back in December. Yeah. Why try again? Well, I, I guess it's amount of, of the um, sort of the uh, the investment. I guess you know he, they've already poured some money into this. You know, as as you said, he paid what thirty five grand for the house. Yeah. But I mean, what are you gonna? What are, you, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna accomplish? You're gonna show the world that, okay, this is inequivocal evidence, but what negative effects is this gonna have on your life? Yeah, because there could be very legitimate attachments in the in a place like that of that nature, if it's as much as a hotbed as everyone says. Yeah, I. This article also says that psychics have come to the house, and uh, they informed the last residents of the house that. That the house was infested with over 200 ghosts and demons. If that's true, uh, I'm not sure how much I put my faith into a, a psychic or anything like that. But just, I mean, because that's a kind of outlandish number, but that is insane to think of that a house is that active. Yeah. And of course, Matt was on the show and he saw that and he goes, dude, we need to go. And I said, dude, no, I'm not. Not even. <laughs> and, and I, you, I mean,. <laughs> No, no. I'm not, going, I'm not going near that house. If I okay, if, if there's something that serious going on in the place, and I, I'm not helping anybody out of it. I don't want to go. No. You know, the thrill that I get out of ghost hunting is seeing the unexplained and trying to explain it. I'm not going out to see this dark shit. Nope, nope, not happening. Um, so, anyways, yeah, that's just some shit that's been going on with Brando and I. Um, Brando. I would have done five push-ups just then if that rule was in effect because I ummed for no reason. So, anyways. Yeah, I've noticed that I've been saying and, and I've been trying to make it work. Yeah, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm new, I'm doing the and pause. And pause. Um, so <laughs> M Marvel, uh, Marvel had a special that was on ABC. I don't know if you saw it or not. It was Marvel from Pulp to Pop. No, I didn't see it. And it was a telling of the Marvel story and talking about, uh, you know, your Jack Kirby, uh, Stanley, Steve Ditko, arid Marvel, um, where Marvel started in the 30s through to the war, to the superhero being unpopular in the 50s because parents didn't want their kids to be reminded of the war because Captain America was created as a symbol of hope as a superhero for civil or for you know the 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 second world war so then you know spider-man is created and the whole ideology behind spider-man's creation was stanley's wife said 
um, before Spider-Man had happened, she had said, you know, because Stan said, I've been in the business 20 years. I'm ready to quit. I'm ready to be done with all of this because it's not working. I'm not drawing or, or creating anything I want to. I'm just putting out these horror stories that people want to, you know, read, but there's no substance. You know, there's no story behind it. And uh, his wife said, well, why don't you for the first, you know, why don't you just tell a story about something that you want to tell a story about? And he created the Fantastic Four. Who does that? Like, hey, <laughs> just do something that you want to do. Oh, amazing team of superheroes. Holy shit, you know? Yeah, man, that's pretty cool. I mean, the fact that, you know, he was ready to, you know, be done with it. That's happened so many different times to so many different creators and, you know, artists over the years. Like, for example, you know, the guy that created Final Fantasy. Yeah. He was ready to get done. He was ready to get out of the business. He wasn't making any money. So he created his, what was going to be his last game, the Final Fantasy. <laughs> and it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Way too many Final Fantasies. But it's a great title. And it's like, in the moment of desperation, the true... Um, heroine or hero, you know, creator is going to create this masterpiece. You know, I mean, look at the guy that did DBZ. They forced him to do another season or two, and he created what I believe is still one of the coolest characters in Boo. Mm -hmm. You know, oh yeah. So I, I find that interesting. So, anyways, the Marvel from Pulp to Pop thing, you know, and they talked about the like what we talked about on the one episode where Marvel had to sell most of their movie rights, and they didn't really talk on who had what they just said you know they were getting ready to go bankrupt sold a lot of their properties and then they started talking about the future and marvel studios now and their plans and then they teased a little behind the scenes footage you know not like a trailer or any official footage but just filming of them filming ant-man and it had paul rudd getting ready to receive the ant-man outfit for the first time and michael douglas's hank pym and it looked really cool, and I'm I'm like chomping at the bit. Like, 2015 is almost here, you know. Let's just get it over with. I'm ready. Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah, and um, 2015 is going to be a huge here a year for films. For films, for video games. I mean. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. For you for know comic events, dude. Marvel yes. announced so much stuff. Like they, uh, what was it? They had just announced. That, like, all these stories that they're bringing back are part of one universal story. Wow. So, Planet Hulk being returned, Civil War coming back, the House of M returning, um, all the, I can't even, oh, they're doing um, X-Men 92, so it's, like, going to be the team from 92 that was in the in the cartoon. Cartoon series, yeah, um, I saw that. They're doing all these different things that's one universe, and I think... What Marvel is planning is that they're going to have all this shit go on next year. It's going to be this huge over-the-top event. You really, re, re, Bringing back major titles like your Secret Invasion, your House of M's, your, your Civil Wars are going to get people to go, well, I want to buy that because I want to know what, how they're going to do this next story. And then you can flatten everything and say, okay, so all these ultra-micro universes that are all a part of this major Secret Wars story eventually become nothing. And we start from scratch. And there's the retelling and the rebirth of Peter Parker and Tony Stark and, and Reed Richards and Stephen Strange and, and you know Steve Rogers. All these Marvel characters get a fresh slate. You've got Wolverine who's dead. The Fantastic Four are being canceled. Like all these things are happening. Start fresh. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's definitely a place to go with that. If that's what they decide to do, I, I I actually hadn't heard about them making all those into one, like long overlapping. Yeah, story. so it's one major event next year, and it's going to probably take place over the entirety of the year. They'll probably string it out where every month is like one or two of the books, and it kind of hmm. filters through that way. You because you, you're not you know you don't want to overload. You don't want to give too many stories in the summer because then no one's ever going to get through them all and you're going to lose your audience. You want to kind of string them along throughout the whole thing. And, and that's Marvel maybe starting the beginning of the end of the beginning, you know, kind of thing. Anyways, um, talk before. To, go ahead. You go. I'm, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add this to the 2015. Oh, shit. We were talking about 2015. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah. There, a certain movie is coming out in 2015. Got a title the other day. Yes, go on. It would be the uh, seventh movie in a very major Yeah, series. and you know, can I say something before you say it? I do definitely, I did, I can tell you with all my heart and soul that I did get it from superhero hype, so they're pumped as the first people to report it. But do you know that the Journey Into Comics Facebook page posted it before the Nerdist and several other major comic book sources? We were Wait. one of the first. <laughs> well, I guess we caught him snoozing, huh? Yeah. See, people, you don't need the Nerdist. I mean, I like the Nerdist. Chris Hardwick, you're like my hero. Don't take that the wrong way. But what I'm saying is we got the news to y'all first, just like we did the same news when Marvel released all the titles of the movies they're doing until 2019. Ta-da! So another thing, Brandon, I think this is 2016, but I didn't know that Uncharted 4 has a title now. Yeah, well, I thought it did have a. T- I thought it did have a title. Yeah, it does now though. I didn't know. Is this something old that I'm missing? Because I was on the PS4 last night and I was browsing for a couple minutes, and I didn't know that you can pre-order on your PS4 now. Like you just buy the game digitally, way yeah, way before it comes out. Which I, I, I guess I don't get it. But whatever. well, they have uh, they have preloading now. Oh, um, okay. To where like you know if you could if you pre-order it and then you um. Uh, maybe like a, f- a few days before it comes out, you can preload it, and then at midnight, It'll then you can finally play it. Instantly play. Yeah, so that way you already have it downloaded. Oh, that's actually kind of cool. Okay, I respect that. But uh, yeah, A Thief's a thief's End. Yep, yep. I like that title. Uh, as It's actually supposed to be coming out in the holiday of 15. Okay, so anyways, let's get back to the real milk and butter. Brandon, seventh movie in a series... <laughs> we we just totally tangented around that. We're like, yeah, we're not gonna talk about. Yes, we are. No, I'm not giving them what they want. <laughs> I'm trying to prove a point that we provide them the news that they need. Okay, and we'll do it how we please. So, anyways, seventh movie in a series, mm-hmm. first time being on the big screen in ten years. Yes, indeed. Go ahead and finish it up for me, brother. What are you thinking? So, this is something that Star Wars fans that are they're looking forward to the new trilogy have been waiting for, pretty much since they got announced. What's it going to be called? Because I remember the hype coming into Episode One. What's it going to be called? And it was called the Phantom Menace. And there was a mixed reaction to that title. And there was a little bit of a mixed reaction to this one. Not as much though, because I personally like it. Yeah, and it's called. It's called Episode 7, The Force Awakens. Just brilliant. It, it, it's, it's, it's a great title because it can be taken in a multitude of ways. Is mm-hmm. this Force Awakening in a Luke Skywalker who is old and dying? Is the Force Awakening in a cybernetic uh, Darth Vader who is all cyber enhancements now? Is the Force Awakening in a new Jedi that has not been seen of this of this universe yet? There are so many paths of what's awakening, you know. Um, the movie franchise is reawakening, and that's really where the real kick to the shin is. Is that that's the kind of the pun behind it? Is yes, the movie the the series is coming back in full force, and it's like. If you're Disney, man, you're firing on so many high cylinders right now. You've got this Marvel train that's just going to... Marvel, I, you know, here's the thing. When Marvel says they're going to release a movie and they give a date, I go, okay, when that date comes, I'm going to go see that movie. When Fox says, hey, we're releasing this movie, I go, we'll see. You know, when Sony <laughs> yeah. says they're going to release a movie, well, we'll see if it actually gets there because it's probably going to get canceled. Um, you know, Spider-Man 4 with Tobey Maguire where John Malkovich was supposed to be the vulture. It would have been great. Anyways, um, I think it could have saved the franchise because 3 was so bad. But anyway, Yeah, let, let's just not go into that. That was no. horrible. Yeah, it was so bad. Anyways, talking about journeys and, and things, Brando, uh, you told me, and it's funny because we kind of 
went into separate paths that I think were both led by a crusader named Westicles. <laughs> because Wes, uh, when we had him on the first time, gave me the legit rundown of, hey, Arrow, get your shit together and watch it. And I powered through it, and I'm totally caught up, and the series is stupid good just on levels that I can't even begin to spoil because it's so worth it to just be impeccably surprised by how great the show is. But you, instead of going to Arrow, which was kind of what I thought you would do, you went to Game of Thrones, and now how has that ruined your life? Oh, it has ruined my life by not giving me enough time in the day to do anything else. Because, <laughs> of course, as I said, I work a lot. And we've been, me and my wife, because she, she's fallen in love with it as well, have not been doing nothing on the weekdays except for watching that damn show. Thankfully, it's only like 10 episodes a season, but... In the later seasons, I think in four, three and four, the, the episodes get almost uh, 60 minutes long. Oh, that's harsh. And so you really get like a feel that you, you almost get an entirely new episode worth of content over the 10 episodes. But I was going to check out Arrow. He, he has me sold on Arrow. Don't get me wrong. I do plan on watching that. But when we got our new, ca- our, our new cable system hooked up, the guy said, hey, it's going to come with free HBO for a while. I'm like, well, that's cool. You know, maybe I can finally watch Game of Thrones because I've been wanting to watch it. I just haven't been, been wanting to pay for it, you know, pay extra. And I've heard a lot of, you know, a lot of good stuff about it. I have I stayed away from all spoilers. Somehow I got so lucky to stay away from every single spoiler from that show with the exception of a terminal of some of the terminology. Yeah, which I don't think you can avoid some of the terminology. I know. And luckily, like you I've pretty much been spoiler free. Um, mm-hmm. I definitely, when I watched the first season of Game of Thrones, and that's as far as I've gotten, I didn't know what was coming at the end of that season. And like we were talking before we started today, I said it was very surprising to me that they yes. would go that route. And it just showed me that this show is so different from anything else that's on t- TV because George R.R. R. Martin is just, he's demonic almost, I think. <laughs> we'll see. Uh- I don't think it's nearly as bad as what some people make it out or make fun of it to be about how they just kill characters on a whim. They don't just kill them on a whim. Sometimes it might seem that way, but in it, but I like it because it throws a wrench into you know the classic storytelling element over you think, okay, that character is still going through their arc. They still need to go here and there, but that's not how real life works. No, and that's very – I mean – They've kind of been on their own very separate paths, but it's very Robert Kirkman walking mm-hmm. dead, except for I think Martin's a little bit more um, trigger-happy. Kirkman's more strategic. But I think Martin decides to kind of have all of his ends might not necessarily be justified by the means. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, let me just say that trigger-happy and strategic – you when you watch this show, you're going to see how each death is, is actually kind of strategic for the good or bad. Huh? It's like, OK, so you said, you know, and, and we've gone through, uh, you know, this show. Anybody who hasn't watched Game of Thrones, fast forward like five minutes because I'm going to spoil something that Nate already knows about. I'm not going to spoil the rest of it. He's, he's seen season one. OK, fast forward now. Wait. For OK, it. wait, wait. OK, now you're screwed. So, because uh, I'm going to ruin it. So they killed. No, Ned don't Star- ruin it. Okay, go ahead and ruin it. I just okay. wanted to make sure. <laughs> so they would. So they went and killed Ned Stark, right? Motherfuckers. And now, hold on. They who's they? Joffrey killed Ned Stark. Mm-hmm. Okay, because he said he gave Sansa his word that he would be merciful. Well, his version of merciful was make it quick. <laughs> yeah. And and he's a very horrible person. That death starts the entire rest of the show. It's the building block. It, it 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 is. I mean, you have season 1 is almost like the um the preamble or the, the prologue uh, or issue 0 if you will. Yeah. In a way. And, and and they also have like, you know, you know, they they talk about the past. They talk about stuff that happened 15 18 years ago that has led up to this point, but then that his death launches the, the the show into the into the next level, and it just it changes it. And most one thing I really like about this show is that they have these character deaths, and they change the show. 
But there's another thing that also changes the show, and that's the character's character growth. And I really like that because you'll see a character, you know, in like in season one that you think, man, I hate that guy. And then later on, you're like, you know what? He's not so bad. And and he he becomes a more likable character. Those are my favorite kind of characters. Like uh, I'm trying to think of a great example of someone who I hated in a TV show. Saul Goodman, for example, comes to mind. Yeah. You hate Saul when he first shows up in Breaking Bad. And by the end, you kind of feel for the guy. Like, man, he has just been drugged through the fucking dirt, and no one thinks twice about it because he's a lawyer. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, Game of Thrones does this with several characters. And the another thing that they do is that they pair them up. Me and uh, me and Nick have been talking about this at work because he is like my Game of Thrones guy at work. I end, up, I end up working with him a lot. He's a huge fan. He listens to our podcast. And, Shout out to you, Nick. Thanks for and, listening, brother. Get more people in. Hell yeah. But we talked about how there are certain pairings on this show where, where you have a couple of the main characters at certain points get together and you just enjoy uh, their dynamic together and how they can either slightly change each other or learn from each other. And they all have like very good chemistry. And th- this show does that a lot. It it, it it tends to, it tends to pair people up a little bit, and then you get to just see them. Another thing about this show that I love, 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 cannot express that amount of love I have for this part of the show, and it's it's long term planning. Because you'll have um, something that's in episode episode you know uh, three or four from season one that's still going on, in ep- like in season three or four, yeah, and it's sometimes the way they do their storytelling it's it's throughout the whole season you have this character over here doing this with you know character B and they are still doing that throughout the season and you're seeing little bits and pieces of that per episode it isn't like in a walking dead where they say okay we're going to go follow uh you know uh so and so for a while and then you're not going to see anything from them, from the other people. It's the, exo- it's the opposite of that. You're going to get a little bit of them. Then you're going to get a little bit of these guys, a little bit over here. Maybe in that episode you won't see a certain character, but then you can guarantee you're probably going to see them in the next one. And since they know that they're not going to get canceled, they know that they're going to go for at least seven seasons, they can actually plan out their story, not have to worry about ending it uh, too soon. Yeah, no premature endings or no, um, you know, you had this big story planned and in season six something fell through and they said, you know what, we don't need Game of Thrones on HBO anymore. No, mm-hmm. I think Game of Thrones revitalized HBO. I think so too. Um, they just did a lot. They they have done a lot with the show and it's it has been getting popular the last couple of years and I haven't been able to watch it. it as I just said, it's very hard to avoid spoilers, but – it was on on demand. I I was getting ready to watch Arrow, and I saw that was on demand, and uh, I kind of had like a little mini argument with my wife. She said we don't have HBO, and I said, "Well, the guy said we did." She goes, "I tried it, and it didn't work." Well, I tried it, and it did work. That's and fate, I, man. And I and I started up Game of Thrones. She goes, "What are we watching?" I said, "Game of Thrones." She goes, "Well, you didn't tell me we we're going to watch it." I said, "Well, we are now." <laughs> and nice. I'm like, "I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it while I got it." And I love the I love the series so much that I'm actually going to keep HBO just for Game of Thrones, just like I kept uh, Showtime for Dexter when I was really liking Dexter. I should I should just teach you the art of the torrent, my friend. Uh, you know I used to do torrents, and I don't do them anymore. Yeah, you got to be careful. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got that's all I can say is you got to be careful. But anyways, um, so you know Game of Thrones. So how close are you, by the way? Are you almost caught up? Are you there? I am two episodes away from being caught up. So where you were yesterday. yesterday. Yeah, yeah. No, we didn't get to watch any last night. We had stuff going on today. When we get, get finished up here, I'm going to, you know, hopefully get to that. Get to caught up. That's awesome. Um, it's a really cool accomplishing feeling to go from, um, like, I, I'm excited. I haven't even started it yet, but I told you my next journey just for the just for the show um, is really to to and we'll talk about this more later is to get into the uh Agents of Shield and they're only into season two, twenty two episodes a season, so there's really only like twenty eight episodes. I destroyed 
Arrow in like a couple days. I'm sure <laughs> I can get through this in like two nights. I would have finished Game of Thrones by now, but since it's something that both me and her are enjoying together. You kind of keep watching it when you can together. Yes, and I don't want to go ahead and then go back and rewatch it. Although we have actually discussed starting the whole series over from season one just to see stuff from a different perspective. Um, crazy that you say that. Um, I started watching Arrow a second time with Sarah, and then a third time now because our friend Stacy, we started her on this uh, journey of Arrow uh, tonight, actually. And now I'm rewatching it, and it's like they were planting seeds that are still blossoming now in season yeah. three and season one, episode one. And we'll it's see, so like, brilliant. Yeah, in Game of Thrones, it has such a rich history for its background, for its backstory. And there's only so much stuff that you were get, that you were told because it's all done in like within the dialogue in passing, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like like there was a big war about 15 to 20 years prior to the start of the show, and you know at the beginning of the show they mention it. You know, the guy who is who is king, him and his buddy Ned went and defeated the king, and so when the show starts, the king needs Ned's help again. That's how the whole show starts. And they have a lot of, you know, they talk and they brag like, you know, they're old war buddies. Well, then you hear more about that war from different perspectives as the show goes on. And it would be really neat to go back and really pay attention to the dialogue choices and what the characters say to 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 kind of round it out a little bit more stuff that you didn't catch the first time around that that, you know, the first time you may think it's just like a throwaway line or something that's just said. As I said, in passing, but it actually has some some meaning to it, and like within their perspective. Yeah, um, funny that you say that about Game of Thrones, um, because I actually was thinking that I need to do that now that I watched the finale of season eight of Doctor Who. And I know you're like two million episodes behind, and I feel so bad, dude. Because don't I just, worry about it. I wish I could just take my hands put them over your head for just like two seconds and transfer every second that I watched just like, so you could be like, Oh, that's badass. I'm caught up and I know everything. Great. You Wasn't know? there like a TV show where a kid could like put his hand on a book and he read the whole book. Oh, uh, what was that? That was a movie. I think. Was it a movie? Was he an alien? Yeah. And I feel like that was like, what the hell was Wait, that? I thought he was like an alien and that he lived in an attic. I I don't know. I don't I know that the doctor can read books by just by touching them, but I I know that there's something else that I've seen that does that too and I can't remember what it was. So uh if you're listening and you know what this is that Brando and I are talking about, hit us up on Facebook at Journey into Comics podcast or Instagram at Journey into Comics. We don't have our Twitter set up. I don't know if we ever will. Um, are there any other ways for people to get a hold of us that I'm missing? Oh, our YouTube channel, if you want. You could always go there, leave a comment in one of our video feeds. Um, I found it. You, you found oh, the, what you were looking for? Yes, The Journey of Alan Strange on Nickelodeon. Yes, absolutely. It aired on, it aired on Saturday nights on SNCC yes. from 97 to 2000. Wow, that takes me back. And... Just to tell you how I found it, I typed into Google, Alien Kid Reads Books by Touching Them. <laughs> Amazing. I love how Google works. Teach oh. me to Googles. Teach me to Googles. Teach me to Googles. Oh, hey, did you hear about uh, Amazon's AI? N- no. I don't remember what it's called now. Dang it. Nick Nick was telling me all about it. And uh, it works kind of like Siri or like the Xbox One uh, Connect. Okay. But it's but it's in your house. It's in your room. And it's always listening to you. And so you can say, hey, you know, uh, Siri, what's the weather like out? And then, and then it'll tell you. Or it'll tell you, uh, hey, what movies are playing? And that way it's always, like, all-inclusive all around you. And then you can even order stuff on Amazon by by just telling it to. Like, hey, can you order me season six of this show? On yeah. Blu-ray, not DVD, please. Yes. And brand new condition, not used. In fact, you know, it just I, I, I want to look that up and see what it's called, but it, it's going to be available for uh, a co- only a couple hundred dollars, I think. That's weird. Amazon AI. All right. 
Work your magic, Google. Teach me to Googles. And of course, it doesn't really come up with anything that I want to know about. Oh, it comes, it comes up with uh, the movie AI. Oh, yeah, yeah. AI in your house. There so you it's gonna go. come up with WWF now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it will. Actually, no, it came up with House Season One. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, you keep no, searching. I'll. Uh... I'll go and discuss the things that are kind of spoilerific for Doctor. Yeah, get go it out ahead, of the go, way. Go while ahead, you're do looking that. It up. So, folks, we are now at the season finale of season eight of Doctor Who. We have our new Doctor, the twelfth Doctor. He has been kind of on this on and off kick of is he a good man? We've seen mummies in a uh, mummies in a train car that's replica of the nineteen twenties. You've got uh, a forest that grows in a second that was the Earth saving its people, which was crazy. But then you, we get to this finale, and the first part of the finale was Dark Water. And uh, right off the bat, spoiler alert, right off the bat, Danny Pink, boom, dead. Kills him. Kills him. Moffat killed him. Hit him with a car, killed him dead. Um, and then, you know, Clara is crying, and she threatens the doctor and she finds all the TARDIS keys that are inside the TARDIS and she throws them in one by one into the lava because there's only one way to destroy a TARDIS key and that's by liquid molten lava and the doctor had kind of tricked her to make her think she had actually done that because he wanted to see how far she could go but she just wanted him to bring Danny back and he he didn't think he could um, you know so the doctor and, and Clara have a little bit of a falling out and then we meet Danny Pink, and he is in this place which they are calling heaven. And he's dead, quote-unquote. And they're explaining how death works, and it is actually as such that when you die, your conscious person, you know, goes into heaven, which is this, like, cloud. And that your feelings, though, what you physically feel in heaven is still attached to your human body and uh so all these souls are screaming don't cremate me essentially which was really dark and creepy then you know they've got this stuff called dark water which only shows um it only shows organic material and you just see all these skeletons sitting in chairs and you're like this is really fucking dark and weird and this lady missy who has been sprinkled through the entirety of this season she is only ever she only ever shows up in the episodes when someone dies. So if there's a death in an episode of season eight of Doctor Who, Missy would show up, and it is then in an epic spoiler alert yet again, um, in an epic reveal, <clears throat> it comes to life that Missy is actually the master. Now people are going, how can a male master become a female time lord? And here's how. It has always been rumored in the mythos of Doctor Who that if you kill yourself as a Time Lord, your ultimate punishment is to be changed into an alternate sex of whichever design your Time Lord goes. You know, if you're a dude, you'll be a girl. If you're a girl, you'll be a dude. So this was the first official time because the Master did technically kill himself that we now get proof that if you do a hideous act of killing yourself as a Time Lord, you become a female. So we do now have rights that they could eventually make the Doctor a woman if they wanted, which could be very interesting. Um, so we come to light that the dark water that only shows organic material is secretly keeping hidden an army of Cybermen. And, you know, Missy reveals that she's the master. The army of Cybermen are marching in Britain. And then it cuts. And then now this week, uh, Death in Heaven was the season finale of Doctor Who season 12. And it, it was so epic um, and weird. There are a lot of questions they stuffed a lot in this episode. You have, um, essentially, they kind of paint the picture that Missy has been traveling through the entirety of of Earth's timelines and essentially is the person that created the quote-unquote vision of heaven as being a place where you go when you die because she was saving all of these souls on a hard drive so that she could send them back to Earth 
um, by proxy becoming a Cyberman. So she said, what's the one tactical advantage that Earth has over anywhere else? The dead outnumber the living. So then she creates an upgraded Cyberman from all these, you know, dead people from forever. So that that's getting all crazy. And you had Clara trying to pretend that she's the doctor and she's not. And then the Danny Pink Cyberman saves her because as a Cyberman who was created the way these Cybermen were created, they don't have their emotion inhibitor attached. And they can't do it themselves, so they need someone else to do it. So Clara is face-to-face -face with Danny, who she has just confessed to the Cyberman, because she doesn't know it's Danny, that the only man in the entire universe, in the entire world of anything, and under any circumstance or duress that she could ever trust and truly care for was the Doctor. And then he takes the, the shield part of his mask, kind of Iron Man style, it slides up, and it's Danny Pink, who's kind of morbid, dead-looking, and he definitely is a Cyberman, but he says that he's, you know, he's crying and he hurts, but he's not Danny Pink anymore because Danny Pink is deceased. He's just this shell. And he says he wants Clara to hook up the inhibitor. And then the doctor shows up to save the day because, you know, the doctor's super cool at getting out of impossible traps set for him. Um, so he comes back to save the day and then he tells Clara to do it and... Then it comes to light that Danny Pink had promised, hey, I'm not going to harm you. So now Missy's plan is kind of starting to slowly backfire. And then Danny Pink essentially, the Cyberman Danny Pink ultimately sacrifices himself to destroy all of these Cybermen that were created from the dead, not the living. Uh, because Danny Pink's a soldier, he kind of commands them that way. And there are a lot of casualties. Osgood dies, which is totally jacked up. Um, Osgood dies and Danny Pink is officially gone and uh, God, what's her name I want to say it's Kate O'Mara but I, I, I'm not 100% but she was in the Day of the Doctor as the Brigadier's daughter she gets thrown out of a plane and you assume she's dead and then they find her in the graveyard where all the Cybermen were and she's on the ground living because the Cybermen Brigadier because the Brigadier is actually in real life passed away um, the Cybermen version of the Brigadier comes and saves her and puts her safely on the ground so she's still breathing she just needs help and then the episode actually ends with Clara and the doctor going separate ways and then all of a sudden uh, there's a voice and the credits roll and then you think that it's done and then there's a voice and the voice is talking about like come on now doctor it, it can't rightly end like that like you gotta make things right you know you gotta fix things with her and then you pan to the door of the interior of the TARDIS, and it's Nick Frost as St. Nicholas, you know, Santa Claus. Um, so they teased the, you know, uh, Christmas special. So that was pretty cool. So overall, the episode, like I said, it packed a ton in, and it was kind of like Moffat was trying to outthink himself. But it wasn't bad. It wasn't a terrible episode. I'm just hoping that the stories that they started in this season for Capaldi kind of get to flourish next season or the season after where we see what could be possibly a new companion and some darker storytelling from Moffat, uh, maybe some fresh monsters to get away from being classic. I thought it was pretty classy that they gave Capaldi um, the Master and Cybermen as a, as a finale. It's really cool. I mean, Eccleston had the Daleks. Uh, Tenant's first season was the Daleks and the Cybermen. But to have the Master, I don't know. Um, oh, the first season for Matt Smith was um, small platoons of all the villains. You know, minor, little, tiny platoons of the Jadoon and the Sycorax and the uh, Slavine and the Daleks and Cybermen and Weeping Angels and the Silence hadn't existed yet, so they weren't there. You know, the Vashta Narada were there. Uh, tons and tons of villains. So uh, for Capaldi to get a really grandioso uh, finale was actually pretty impressive. I just think they tried to fit too much into it, and that is my take on Doctor Who Season 8. Brando, how we doing, brother? Uh, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> cool, you probably have no idea what I was talking about. I was listening for the last half. I spent the first half of it kind of zoning you out, letting you fill in the audience about Doctor Who because I was looking up that Amazon AI thing. 
you find it? Yeah, I did. It's called Echo. Oh. Weird. And base yeah, it's gonna cost two hundred dollars. Okay. And then a hundred dollars for Amazon Prime members. Oh wow. Yeah. And basically they're they're still doing like you know, they're they're gonna be doing a test with it, you know. Hmm. And also you can't go out and just buy it, you have to be invited to buy it. Oh weird. So you have to like uh, apply for an invitation. It's kind of like the, the Google Glass. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, I've only ever seen one person ever wear a Google Glass. I've never ever seen anybody ever. I saw uh, an Asian guy. This uh, Asian guy at the PS4 launch had one. Oh, cool. Was it cool? I don't know. I don't. Do it you threw say, me. Up. Can I see it? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. No. Uh, I just happened to just catch it. I. Uh, he was walking by, and I saw him, and I, it was one of those double take things. I was like, "Was he wearing gl- no? Oh, Google Glass. Okay." I was trying to figure out why he was wearing glasses that didn't have any uh, lenses in them. <laughs> uh, yeah. I thought maybe it's some sort of new kind of fashion statement, but no. You know, I'm not sure how I feel about that. That's one of the re- main reasons that if I ever get an Xbox One, I will not have the Connect plugged in because I don't like having something that's always listening. Even if they say, "Hey, what about your cell phones and whatnot?" Not you know, the cell phone is something that I actually need. Yeah, you don't need your connect listening to your every thought. No. It's kind of scary. Or uh, sitting there watching me while I'm playing and then putting up ads for Doritos on the dashboard, which I always hated how Microsoft puts up ads on the dashboard. Yeah, totally BS. I'm, so, so Brandon, I'm, I'm done you, with that. You're talking about Xbox. You're talking about video games. I got to know, man. How's the pickups been coming along? Well, I think the last time that we were together, uh, which – Pretty fucking epic. Was that the last time you and me were on a were, were on a show together? No, was Ghost Hunt part. The Ghost two. Hunt one, yeah. So we didn't really talk about anything like that. Okay, so I had an NES bundle when I went up to your neck of the woods and we did the I Am Taco episode, and we went through that, and I ended up getting the um, this little bundle of games. What was it nineteen games and uh, some controllers and a zapper and all that stuff? And I, you know, I got a good deal on that. Well, I ended up striking a really good deal. Over Craigslist for an NES system, which I ended up buying up in your neck of the woods. I got uh, you know, well, with the top loader system. Yeah. But I got the original model now, and I got 29 games, and I, I got it for 60 bucks. That's ridiculously awesome. And nothing uh, too rare. I, I believe these are all common games, but let's just say that when you have – Five dollar game, five dollar game, five dollar game, four dollar game. You know, then you got, you know, a couple on there that are twenty dollars. I want to say I had at least four or five that were twenty dollar games. So you, you again, I, I said this when we were off air. You could make money from that deal actually if you turned them oh, yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. You know, I did get a couple of you know uh, duplicates because when you're going to be buying stuff in in, in lots, you're going to get duplicates right. because there's going to be games like that everybody had. You know, was, you know, I. I got uh, Super Mario Brothers three from Veronica, and then I got it in this one as well. Nice, very cool. Um, so you got your sixty dollar pickup, and then you had a kind of flop story that you were telling me, and I feel yeah. real awful about it, man. I really do, but uh, I, I kind of want you to elaborate to the audience your 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 situation is the best. Yeah. Way that. Um, for the games that I got in that lot, uh, I'll, I'm going to be filming a video at the end of November. So, you know, as anybody who's been following our YouTube channel, I've been putting up videos of the games that I've been getting and collecting, and I'll I plan on doing that one a month for the foreseeable future and throw some other stuff in. But this story I'll also share in that video. But it, I got an I had another little thing set up for some original Xbox games, and one of them in there was one that I've been looking to get a hold of that I could actually buy cheaper for another system. But since it's, I don't know, I'm it just, it's the thought of getting that game, knowing that it's more expensive on the Xbox, and knowing that I could try to get it cheap. It, it, it's, it's a rush, man. It is such a big rush. And that game was Star Wars Battlefront 2. And I own the first one, and I don't know what happened to it. Nate, I think you kept it. <laughs> really? I think I, I think I let you borrow it, and then you ended up just kind of holding on to it. Oops. But like back on the PS2, I think I bought it on the PS2. Oops. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Um, but so I got a hold of this, you know, of of, of, the, of the seller, 
and she was selling all the all the Xbox games that she had for three dollars a piece. And there were six games, so eighteen bucks. I mean, you, you know, Battlefront Two goes for like forty bucks, and I was going to get it for three bucks. And you know, it, it would sound like a great deal. And I said I would take all the games if she would hold it until Saturday because I had messaged her. Messaged, I can't talk. That word's <laughs> hard sometimes. I got back to her. <laughs> I told go. her I would be in town. And but in about a week or like less than, and that if you would, she would hold on to all of them. I'll, I'll go ahead and take all of them just for the trouble. And so she said, okay. And we had it set up, and I met, and I started opening up the boxes. I opened up Star Wars, and there's no damn disc in there. Breaks my heart for you, bro. Did you take it, the case? Yes. So I have the case, and I have the manual. Well, that's good. Um, and then I didn't pay for it, you know. Uh, I opened it right there in front of them, and so I paid for the other games, and I didn't pay for that one, so... Yeah, if anybody has just the disc or a way that I can get that game for relatively cheap, uh, definitely hit me up. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> would be awesome. That, man, that was a buzzkill. I mean, okay, the NES bundle, I actually drove an hour out of my way to go get. I, I mean, it's I drove an hour, like, the opposite direction towards Illinois. Oh, goodness. And then drove all the way to Illinois. Oh, jeez. You know, to go see my dad and then meet uh, the seller for the Xbox stuff. So it that panned out, but the other one did not. And, they, you know, the other games I got, you know, you know, they're all right. Nothing that I was overly excited to get because obviously the Star Wars one was the gem in there. But it was just a freaking buzzkill for the rest of the night. Yeah, but you win some, you lose some, man. You just got to take your bumps, you know. Yeah. I've learned that lesson a couple times, whether it be buying a comic that has a stamp cut out that I didn't even think to check for or, you know, shit like that. You just take your licks and you keep going. You know, that's what the, us collectors do, man. Yep, and as the ever-game-buying uh, addict that I ha- that, that I am now, I'm, I'm cruising the, uh, the website 99 Gamers. And I just found a game that I did not even knew it existed. Go on. Star Wars Racer Revenge. Um, it is a, game it is a Cube. I found it on the PS2. Okay. But it is the sequel to Episode One Racer on the N64. Yep. Yep. I'll be damned. I didn't even know they made that. I loved that game. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Pod racing. Hell, yeah. Yeah, they actually released that on um, on, on Dreamcast. Remember, we actually found that. Yes, yes. When we were out game hunting together. Um, Brando, I told our audience I'd be trying a new show for the sake of the show called Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, I've always wanted to get back to the show because I started a couple episodes when it was on Hulu, and for some reason, the shows that I start on Hulu, like that are comic book related, I can't stay behind. But remove any ads at all and let me just get the story unfiltered, and I'm totally about it. So I'm going to start Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. over, mm-hmm. and a lot of that reason is because of a rumor I had read online that said that they are going to pretty much put the Stanford incident that started Civil War in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and build the Civil War movie in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., essentially being proactive to the Marvel Cinematic Universe instead of reactive like the Captain America 2 uh, reveal that happens in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that I know what happens in Cap already, but Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I'm not sure what they talk about. So I think it's really creative of Marvel if they go about this route that they're going to be going, hey, our television show is going to affect our movies, and our movies affect our TV show, and that's one conducive universe that works together. And the Netflix and the Defenders, those guys are going to be a part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe at some point, and everything that we can do that's Marvel that is under our banner, we're going to go for. And I just love it. So I'm thinking Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is going to pan out. Wes gave it a great great recommendation. So hopefully we do lead to what is this rumored Civil War goodness. And let me elaborate on that really quickly. Um, There's an actor whose name I didn't care to remember. Um, That's not anything against him. It's just when you read a lot of facts all day and all the different rumors and gossip stuff about superhero stuff, you tend to forget the minor details. So said actor posted a comment on his Twitter, or he tweeted um, just this one tweet that said Mockingbird, and then a character who 
uh, it was the character's real life name, but that character who is uh, whose real life life name the guy tweeted is also known as Speedball, who's a part of the Stanford incident. Uh, then they they posted Shield and they posted Soon, so essentially saying Mockingbird, who just appeared in Agents of Shield season two, uh, plus him, uh, allegedly being that character on Shield, Marvel's Agents of Shield, Soon being a precursor to what's to come. So if they introduce this character early enough and they get people connected to him and they do the Stanford incident the right way, it would be really badass to set up the Marvel Universe in the movie realm off of what Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. does. So I'm going to give it a try, and Brandon, here's my promise. If I get through it and I don't like it, or I do like it, regardless, my next show will be Game of Thrones because i got to be able to be caught up with you and be able to talk the talk, you know? Um, oh, man. You will not um, be sorry for that. If you if you told me you loved season one. it Yeah, I know. It was great writing season one. It's, and, uh, it's and ecstatic. It's, I'm sorry. I know we're a comic show. I'm just going to be real honest. Uh, what is her name? The Dragon Chick. Her tits, I mean, they're in the show. <laughs> I'm just being honest, man. Emilia Clark. God, she's f- so hot. Yeah, oh yeah, Daenerys is, yeah, oh yeah. Jesus, you know. Um, and then you had Jason Momoa was Cal Drago, and you can't beat that. I mean, Jason Momoa is a badass, and we're going to, ho- I hope Aquaman's cool. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. see. The, uh, one, one, one thing that, yeah, <laughs> we're going back to Game of Thrones here, but. That they do that, that they write women very well. I yeah, mean, I noticed that. There's a lot of strong women in that show, and that's that that's really cool because you don't see a whole lot of that in television nowadays. No, not at all. Um, but um, I want to kind of piece some things together. I don't know if you had checked my update on our little outline here. But I want to talk about two more DC shows that are out. We didn't get new Flash this week, just to update folks. Uh, There was no new Flash this week. It was the election on Tuesday. They didn't want their ratings to be interfered by people checking shit with people running this country into the ground, regardless of who they stand for. That's just (laughs) a fact, because that's how it works. So, no new Flash, but I, I have invested three episodes into Constantine, and, meh, there are some mildly scary things, and I'm going to give it a full season. I'm not going to give up on it. I'm just going to watch till the end of the season, and hopefully they make me a fan. I have too quickly learned that it is counter-beneficial to me to give up on a show too early, because I did it with Arrow. It turned out phenomenal. I've done it with Game of Thrones, and you tell me you telling me it's great is essentially like me watching it, because we have very, very similar distinctive tastes. So, oh, yeah. I know I'm gonna like it. I just gotta get there. Um, so, with Constantine, man, they're, they're trying, but it's just... It's almost like there are too many Easter eggs. I don't know anything about John Constantine or that universe, and... I'm looking for these Easter eggs, like, what's going to happen next? Where, where does that tie into the universe? Where does it make this happen? And I don't even know what happens, you know, but I'm assuming because people are like, oh, he's a part of this, and there's this character that's attached to him and another character that's attached to him. So I feel that I'm trying to focus on the writing, but I'm get, catching myself going, well, was that an Easter egg? And it's taken away from the show. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does have some creep factor They had a really cool take on uh, this last episode was called The Devil's Vinyl, and it was essentially that this blues dude, kind of like Mashed Potato Johnson in in Metalocalypse, um, (laughs) blues train of coming blues, you know? Um, (laughs) um, But uh, he's playing this, you know, jam, and he's just bluesing out, and there's some dark energy that essentially kills him, blows him up, dude. Like, and they show the blood splatter on the glass and it's gorific, you know? And I'm like, this is on, I don't even know what channel. I think it's NBC or Fox or something. I think it's NBC. It's one of the major channels. Yeah. So, and then it comes to light that if you listen to it, uh, if you listen to the record that was hidden by this one dude who, you know, 
is old and dies right after he admits that he knew about the recording. Like one dude listens to it and his ears freeze and he stabs himself in the throat. And then this girl listens to it and she becomes like crazy possessed and shit and hears these voices. And there's these other dudes that are trying to, uh, they play the record at a nightclub and kill a bunch of people just because they're like obsessed with it or something. Like it's weird, it's dark. But like I said, I got to give it a chance. I'm not going to give up on this show, even though I'm not really fond of it. They haven't kept me enticed as a viewer to keep watching, you know? I haven't even given it a shot yet. I mean, I, it's already been well known that I've been doing nothing but watching Game of Thrones. So I really haven't had time. To, I've fallen behind on Gotham. Yeah, which is sad because, man, Gotham is getting really good. Let me tell you what. Um I'm not. I'm gonna try to. I'm. I'm definitely gonna avoid spoiling because you'll be able to catch up Gotham. You're like only two episodes behind. Yeah. But how they were taking the Joker, what they've done in the last couple episodes, pushing the envelope. They've introduced uh, Victor Zaz to the show. Interesting fun fact: the guy that plays Victor Zaz in Gotham is the same dude that plays the Mist in the Flash. Um, huh. Now, the mist in the Flash, you don't really see a whole lot of his face. He's more of a mist because that's the character's nature. And they, But they're both bald characters, so it's definitely the same dude, and you can kind of like tell. Um, but other than that, no, I mean, Gotham has just been on point. It's weird. I read rumors. People are saying Gotham is slow, and it's not very good. I have yet to find a bad episode of Gotham. Yeah, no, like I, I've liked every episode that I've seen, and I want to say that um, I just read somewhere where they're actually uh, starting to increase their audience. Well, they have to. I mean, people are. I mean, people that I know, like I'm sure I could tell Dad right now, and it's early enough. I, hey, man, you should watch this. It's really good, and he'd get into it and be like, "Wow, this is really. This is actually about Batman. Really, this is really good." Like, uh, people who don't typically like Batman can get into the show. It's got enough crime and drama and act. Of course, I've got the hiccups. <laughs> Damn it. It happens. <laughs> I took your uh, little uh, your T-shirt slogan away from you. Okay, they're gone. I had to hold my breath. That was intense. <laughs> so, uh, but people who don't necessarily know Batman, they they have enough of these different elements from things that people do like your your action, your drama, your adventure, your mystery, your crime solving type elements to shows that are popular. But it just is is firing on all cylinders, and and Gotham just keeps keeps chugging along. And you know they announced this week or last week that allegedly or officially they're going to be planting seeds that lead to uh, the Scarecrow. Mm -hmm. Um, and by proxy, it's going to be a young Jonathan Crane who essentially takes the Scarecrow mantle from his father. Um, and that's going to be how they build the, you know, age similarity with Bruce and Jonathan Crane. Yeah. I, I want to say a few episodes ago, I think I, I read, I think I said where he was going to be coming and I wasn't for sure if it was going to be in the next episode or not, but that was I, a crazy episode, the goat episode. Did you see that one? No, I have not seen that one. Yeah, that episode is really good, but the last two... So maybe you're three episodes behind. I'm not... You're somewhere, but not too far back, but tomorrow's another episode, so um, play catch-up. <laughs> oh, I plan on it. As soon as I get done with uh, Game of Thrones, I'm going to be going straight back to Gotham and finishing and those few like, up. Uh, it's like there's a never-ending journey for us. But, I mean, if I catch up on Game of Thrones and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and then you catch up on Arrow and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., we'll be pretty much all there on all the stuff that's common. Right about, yeah. Uh, crazy thing, I made a little list the other day when I was at work, and I realized every day of the week, well, up and until tonight, or, yeah, well, yeah, up and until yesterday, every day of the week except for Thursday, I had a major television program that's really good, well-written for the most part, minus Constantine, on uh, every night. So um, Monday, Gotham. Tuesday, The Flash. Wednesday, Arrow. Thursday, like I said, there's nothing. Friday has Constantine, which I'm still – jury's out on that. Saturday was Doctor Who, and Sunday is The Walking Dead. <laughs> so six out of seven days have a 45-minute television program that's decent writing, like well, really great writing, and then jury's still out on Constantine, so we'll see where they go with that. Speaking of – the DC Universe, Jared Leto 
is maybe going to be playing the Joker in the Suicide Squad movie. And the Suicide Squad movie, they have just been throwing big names out. Jesse Eisenberg, Tom Hardy, Will Smith, Ryan Gosling, Jared Leto is the Joker. What? <laughs> no. Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, he's got really good acting chops, but God, do you understand the douche level that is Jared Leto? You know what? Yes, I do. Um, I, but I will play devil's advocate here and say that everybody was saying the same thing about Heath Ledger, and he brought something entirely different and new to the Joker. But I, I worry that and it's funny you bring up Heath Ledger because that's actually my big concern. I fear that Jared Leto is going to try to out Ledger, Ledger, and that's going to make the Joker representation bad. If he even takes the role, he might be so douchey that he says, "I don't even want a shot at that because I'm too good for a role that is that nature." <laughs> I have to do artist indie movies, you know. What? Okay, so what you just said is that actually strikes me as very funny because you don't want him to play the role, but then you're saying that he might be too big of a douche to even take the role. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying, it, it, okay, that is the way it seems. I'm, I'm kind of saying, I want him to play the role because I want to see if he would out Ledger Ledger. I don't uh-huh. want him to play the role because I'm afraid he will out, uh, uh, he'll attempt to out Ledger Ledger, and he's going to be massive douche. Then there's my side that says. He would take the role like, oh, thank you, that's so gracious, but I know that's not the person he is. I mean, I once in a while, via Christian hand, uh, know what Jared Leto is posting, and I always come back to, God, he is the douchiest human on earth. Like, I'm pretty sure Jared Leto wears shirts with his face on it. Like, that level, you know? <laughs> so I think that the Joker, he'd be like, oh, that character is below me. I want an Oscar-nominated movie role. I don't want some bullshit, you know, Joker guy that's not going to be nominated. However, Ledger was, so there's that. Um, I don't want to see him try to be Ledger. I mean, if someone's going to come in and play the Joker, it's got to be a, a different take on the Joker entirely. Yeah, different. Some- I mean, you 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 can see where Ledger, uh, he he did his entirely own thing with it, but he did have a, some little some influence from you know obviously other iterations of like other character. But going forward, since that was such a big role, not only for Ledger, not only for the you know for the Batman series as a whole, but also for that character. That re envision that's what people are going to compare it to. So it, it, it cannot even be remotely close to what Ledger did. It cannot – he it, if he licks his lips – Oh, they can't – he can't lick his lips. He can't have his face scarred. He's just got to have cra- – his makeup's got to almost be perfect this mm-hmm. time. But it can't be Jack Nicholson perfect. No. Because then it's too – and it can't be – he can't be kooky Caesar Romero – He's got – whoever ends up playing the next Joker because inevitably we will have another Joker has got a tough a tough shoe to fill. Um, there are so many great iterations of the Joker character. I mean even Mark Hamill in the animated series is a great representation of that character. Oh, yeah. So – and I mean Mark Hamill in the, in the video games as well. Uh, so for me – Whoever has the task of of becoming the Joker has to almost be off-putting and almost – it's like I could almost see a guy like John LaJoy who you probably don't know who he is. He wrote a song called High as Fuck. He also wrote a song called Show Me Your Genitals. Um, But he's got a kind of dry, (laughs) off-putting sense of humor that I would almost like to see out of the Joker where it's almost like – Hey, I'm not here to hurt you. Everything's cool. Like, do you need do you sincerely need some water while he's got a gun to your head, you know? Like he's trying to be hospitable, but at the same time he's insane, you know, this un yeah. this great imbalance of the character. Uh so I can only hope that uh, whoever does fill the shoes of the Joker does a good job. I just I think it's almost an uh, you say this every time when there's a, a new casting of of a character, it's an impossible task. Who are they going to get? They'll never be able to fill that role. Channing Tatum is Gambit. Um, I said it too. Channing Tatum, Gambit. Really, that's happening. And he's going to be in Apocalypse. Um, X-Men Apocalypse. Weird. So, Brando. Yes? You're ahead of the game, and I'm behind on the game. 
and there's Walking Dead stuff. And we can't yes, talk sir. about this week, and I'm really sorry, folks, but I don't have cable, so I can't watch it in real time. i got to be kind of illegal about it. I'm going to sneeze, folks. Bless you! <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me that that was, like, legit and not just put on for the it show. It was legit. That is so funny. You, we need to capture that and make that a button. Oh, I can make it a button. Watch you. <laughs> it's like a blast off. I don't know. It was just like I have to sneeze, oh. and I needed to be entertaining about my sneeze, so I just went with it. And that was the best thing that happened. I'm sorry, folks. My allergies just kicked me in the fucking nose. So anyways, I, we've got Walking Dead stuff going on. Brandon, let's get a little fill-in for the past two weeks. Try not to spoil anything on this week, and uh, we'll discuss as we can. All right. I And I, I really hate you because I really wish we could talk about this week's. I know. I know. I'll catch up. Watch you. <laughs> Watch you. <laughs> That's great. It hurt, kind of. <laughs> Oh, that's even greater. So, two two weeks ago on the well, three weeks now, three weeks ago on The Walking Dead, we had what I could be strongly considered as one of the most grotesque scenes on television. It, definitely in a long time. Definitely, uh, I mean, arguably, right? I mean, the they did not drag out that Hunter storyline any longer than it needed to go. Nope. I was a uh, I was afraid that they were going to do that for half for a half season, and which they could have. They were going to be stuck in terminus for most of the season. I did too. Yeah, uh, yeah. I thought this season was going to be pretty much the hunter season, but it you know it didn't turn out that way. It was like but, the hunter's hour. Like here you go. Here's your one hour of fame. Let's move on. Bigger stories to get to. Let's go. I know, but I also it was it they they stayed true to the comic Very. for the most part. Very true. I mean, yeah, they, the whole Bob thing uh, happened to um, Dale, in which uh, it, it's kind of funny because the way that they uh, that they killed Dale off in season two, they had to find different people to have their legs chopped off. <laughs> yeah, for the show. Yeah. So you know, so 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 there's that. But then and there's the also uh, hold on. There's also tainted meat. <laughs> dead meat you know he's fucking <laughs> screaming like haha you dumb bastards you ate a zombified guy <laughs> uh but yeah it's, i i really liked uh the pacing of the first 3 episodes of this season they really got to it really quickly the fact is is that was it a couple weeks ago on the culmination of that part of that story uh, Rick's groups kind of fakes you out a little bit. It, they, or, or or at least they faked Gareth's group out and make them think that they're going to come after them after Gareth's group dropped Bob off at the church, just like in the comics with, that they did with Dale to try and work them up and get them all um, nervous and scared, make them uh, make them not you know think straight. But that really came back to haunt Gareth and his group. Oh, in such in a, a sexy way. It was, it was brutal. <laughs> I mean, you know, you've got Gareth's guys. They storm the church. Uh, part of the team had stayed behind in the church. They're hiding. They've got Judith there. And, you know, the creepiest part of that episode, I think, uh, not the darkest because we'll get to that, but the creepiest part, I thought, was when Gareth was calling out everybody and where they were. Yes. Like, I know that your new friend Abraham is in there. I know that, um, or not Abraham, but um, rather Ty. I know you, I know Tyrese is in there. I know Judith is in there. I know that you're in there, Carl. Like, and he keeps going on. And I know that Rick and Michonne and all these people went away. And then <clears throat> the one thug for Gareth's group says, "Are we done? You know, like, are we going to stop? Like, do we need to scare them anymore? Let's just get it over with." And then he takes a bullet to the dome. <laughs> and you just go, oh fuck yes! What is going on here? Oh yeah, it, it, it always uh, it always amazes me that Rick could actually hit somebody with the way he holds the gun. Oh, I know, right? 
he kind of tilts the gun like like towards the ground. And that kickback, you know, that <clears throat> fucking jack your wrist up. Yeah, but actually, in, in this scene, he was actually using a different pistol and with a silencer as well. And so Rick's group gets the jump on Garrus guys, and they start surrounding them. And, you know, they start kind of going through the whole kind of the motions. And, oh, they uh, Rick also shoots uh, Garrus' fingers off, a couple of them, because he's holding the gun. Yep. So he, so he disarms Gareth. He's down. And Garrus says that he's not going to beg, but he kind of proceeds to beg. Yes, he really does. And that you notice Rick has that machete that he mentioned in episode one of the season that he had. He said, I have a machete with a red handle, and I'm going to kill you with it. And that's what he did. <laughs> oh, and it was so gory. Just Abraham using the butt of the gun to bash dude's <clears throat> skull in and yeah. was shown, but especially just Gareth getting hacked to death by this machete, just guts and neck and everything just getting sliced open. Um, very brutal for the group to do that, I thought. Yes, uh, there was two character, a few characters that didn't partake in this. Daryl. Uh, well, yeah, because he was gone. But uh, mainly, uh, uh, Glenn and Maggie did not. Uh, oh yeah, that's true. Glenn, Maggie, and Tara, I believe, and Eugene. Yeah. Didn't get their hands dirty. Everybody else did. Rick, Abraham, Sasha. Michonne, uh, they they pretty much destroyed Gareth's group, and they didn't and they didn't do it. You know, they shot a couple of them, but they beat the hell out of them with other instruments. And then uh, we had a big reuniting uh, of Michonne and her sword. Yeah, she picks it up, and it was just like you could almost see it in her eyes, man. It was like, oh my god, I'm alive again. <clears throat> like I'm back. It's kind of funny because she kind of talked about how, you know, I don't miss it. I, you know, I don't need it. And there she is. And she's like, it's like, oh, how I've missed you. <laughs> yeah. She's like fondling the sword. I'm like, whoa, get a hotel room. Yeah, something like that. But um, so then the group splits up. <sighs> it's so annoying. Why do they keep splitting up? You're in the fucking zombie apocalypse and you have a strong group of leaders. Stick together at all cost. Yeah. Well, it just uh, it's the kind of the way it. Way it goes sometimes, but Abraham took off with uh, Eugene, Tara. Uh, who else went? Maggie, Maggie and Glenn. Glenn. I think that was it, right? I think so. Yeah. Uh, you said Rosita, right? No. Nope. Yeah, Rosita went too. Rosita, yeah, because Rosita's and, just with Abraham and Eugene. That's just get used to that. <clears throat> they're they're a uh, trio. Tri yeah, they're they're like kind of a trifecta a little bit. Yeah, and the rest of them stayed at the church to wait for uh, Daryl and Carol to get back from wherever they went. And we hear some rustling. Michonne, right? Here's the rustling. Yes, yes. And out of the bushes comes a Daryl. And Daryl is with, we don't know, but he says come out, and then it obviously cut away. And then we got led into what I thought was kind of a dip to the series it was a really slow episode that didn't do much for me the beth heavy episode where we're finding out that she is now kind of part of a, a almost like a cult of a group of people who believe that if they saved you and they used their resources to save you you essentially owe them until they feel you have paid back the life debt of them saving your ass yeah, it, it was definitely an, an interesting episode. Uh, I liked it for the fact for the fact that it it it, it was a different era, you know, vibe. It, it was a different area, so that it brought something new. But at the same time, it was after the first three episodes, and it's kind of fast pacing, and it and it being on edge from pretty much the whole time. To to, to go and do this, it was. It did bring it down a little bit. It's like, Kirkman, again, you split us up last time, and last season wasn't bad, but the whole, oh my gosh, the group is split up. Oh my gosh, hopefully we reunite. Like this, We've seen this a couple times, people. Andrea got separated. Michonne was sep Well, Michonne didn't know she was separated, but she was separated and then became a part of the group. You know, the governor was separated from the group and then found the group and tried to destroy them a second time, you know? Um, rest in peace, Herschel. Um, 
So I just I felt this was bad timing. Again, bad timing Billy, like just slowing the pace down way too much. And I and I think Kirkman and, and their creative team, Nicotero, they all were hoping that it was still high octane because we haven't seen Beth since last season when she got kidnapped. And now here we are, and it's just not developing how I expected. No, uh, if it pays off in the end, then it'll be worth it. But because we we had this kind of long episode, as you said, about developing this new place, these new characters, and uh, you know Beth kind of wakes up in a very similar and almost a kind kind of a throwback to the way Rick woke you know, you woke up in the first episode. Yeah, that's true. I didn't even think about it like that. So, you know, that was something kind of neat. But then as it starts developing and going on, it's not as interesting of a story as I think they were hoping it would be. Or at least it's not to me. You know, it, you know, if people may have liked it. But it, to me, it, it was sort of a a slowdown. I felt like it was a little, little bit, like a little flat. Even like the uh, her escape attempt with a character in that who was also in this hospital. Because uh, that's where they're actually at. Yeah, they're in a hospital. Yeah. <clears throat> And they're in. They're actually in in Atlanta, aren't, yes, aren't they? They're back in Atlanta, which is crazy, because that just kind of shows how far Beth is separate. I mean, uh, I think Atlanta was season one, mm-hmm. and Rick's group has since moved from Atlanta to the farm, from the farm to the prison, from the prison to, well, you know, the now the church, you know, and they were they spent a lot of time in the prison, which made sense very much to how the comics were, where there was a decent chunk of time spent in this one location that seemed like the safe haven that it didn't turn out to be. Uh, so, you know, Beth is far away from the group. That There is no doubt about that, and that makes me kind of fear that maybe she's becoming expendable. And uh, I know you want everybody wants to say, well, maybe she, uh, you know... Maybe she's not as safe as we think she is because she's friends with Daryl. Maybe she's on the chopping block. You know, you've always got to wonder what Kirkman's planning. Yeah, you know, I mean, they, they, you know, they killed Bob off. Uh, we didn't mention that actually in that episode. Uh, he uh, in season when well, I season two in episode two he he was bit, and so it was only a matter of time before he was going to, to die. That was a pretty sad scene with Sasha too. It was, and uh, it, it it actually speaks to a testament on how they can actually give enough time to create a character and get enough time to get him over with the audience because, you know, people liked him in the end, where if, uh, most people at first didn't really care for him. He seemed and, like an expendable character, like, why waste my time on learning about Bob? He's just a dude. And then as soon as you did, then they killed him. Yeah. But uh, some of the main characters have been there for a while. Had there, there's I, I feel like there's going to have to be some shakeup coming up because – you're just going to be having these same characters for so long and it it, it kind of deviates from what the show is and i understand that um over time you're going to get more you know more averse to your surroundings and these walkers and people are not going to be in as much danger as they once were but then when people let their guard down that's when shit happens yeah and i think that was uh talked about um, very, very early in this season with Rick telling Carl, you're, you, even when you think you're safe, you're never safe. Mm-hmm. And that kind of comes back to Bob and, and his situation and then everything that we're kind of experiencing now. My question is, let's have a little uh, on-the-spot debate here uh, pr- prior to our closing of this episode. Who do you think Daryl has with him? Hmm. Huh. I see. It could be. Um, I'm thinking it's got to be more than one person. More than one person. Okay. So I'll I'll put my little two cents in, and I'm worried that they're gonna do this. And if they do, I hate to say it, but The Walking Dead's gonna start to get a bad stereotypical rap. But part of me thinks that it's gonna be the Noah character that was in the hospital with Beth. That being mm. said, that is again. We just lost Bob. Yes, Bob is a black character. Oh, <laughs> now here's Noah, okay. another black character joining the group. I see and where you're it going. T Dog Tyrese. I, you can. It doesn't. The skin color doesn't matter, people. You could replace one of the lesser white characters that don't matter, and it doesn't matter. But it 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 looks crazy. 
that every time one black character dies, they are replaced by another black character. <laughs> that it's just if that's the case, and we don't know that that's the case. I just you don't want it to have the wrong impression. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it could be coincidental. I'm, honestly, I think um, we need to bring up that at the end of the Beth Heavy episode at the hospital. Oh yeah, right at the very end, Carol is being seen being rushed in on a gurney, and she is passed out or knocked out. So that's how that episode ends. So, you, so Daryl and Carol are they end up in Atlanta as somehow. And somehow they end up having some issues, and their group says Carol. So Carol and Beth are going to have a little run in soon, and that's going to it's it's going to lead to the end of that little story arc. But think about it like this: we've only got like three episodes left of this of before this, the mid season. Yeah, before the mid season. So, oh, God, ridiculous. <laughs> and then I realized that um, Arrow. I don't see. I don't know how Arrow works because they're longer. They have twenty three episodes in their seasons. So, like, episode 11 would probably be, like, 10 or 11 would probably be their mid-season cutoff. But um, they're supposed to do episode 8 and 9 as the two-part Flash crossover with both those shows. Four hours per show total, allegedly, if what Wes is saying was true, where uh, the two episodes of Arrow will be two hours apiece, the two episodes of Flash will be two hours apiece, and they'll all be crossover-related. <sighs> if that's true, and that that's got to be your mid-season finale. And that's kind of in what I would consider a little bit early. Like yeah. only episode nine and then you've got 13 episodes. That's a whole nother big season, a long season of a show. So I'm hoping that they find a good way to balance and break it up and not and not miss on the things that they could do well with the big crossover event like this that's, you know, really on the DC side being done properly for the first time. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm really excited to getting caught up on on both of those here. Here down the line, I'm gonna have a lot of time off during Christmas to be able to really catch up on some shows. Yeah, so I'll uh, go ahead and throw this your way. I said that I had a surprise and I didn't mention it on air yet, but ladies and gentlemen, I have a little surprise that's specifically for the show and us as people, and then it's gonna kind of benefit another person. And Brandon, this is kind of what I've got going on. I've become friends with another tattoo artist. This one is not, um, her name is Maria Saber and she is not like a been on ink master famous, but she is kind of becoming a big leaguer in the circuit of tattoos because she is a primary tattoo artist of the comic book anime style. Okay. Now yeah. I became friends with her through m mutual friends of Corey Hampshire, who's my artist guy friend, um, who um, I've met through comic shops up here. Uh, so I, t I got a hold of Maria and I said, "Hey, I really like your work, and uh, I think you're creative enough. Um, do you do commission work?" Um, and I had this idea, and me and her have kind of elaborated on it a little bit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have her on the show sometime whenever it works out for both of our schedules, or all three of our schedules, rather. She's going to Skype in. We're going to talk. We're going to give her some airtime to explain to people how she does what she does, where they can see her artwork, things of that nature. And in exchange, and maybe a little extra cash we'll throw her way, she is going to draw us our own uh, Journey into Comics number one cover with you as Batman and me as Star-Lord. <laughs> That's cool. Um yeah, so we're still kind of working out the design phases, but um, me and her had talked. I thought that'd be a really neat thing, and that's why I asked you if you could be one superhero, who would you be? And you responded with Batman, of course. So <laughs> Because he's a fucking ninja. <laughs> Pretty sure that that was my exact quote. <laughs> uh, yes, because he is a fucking ninja. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's going to be fun. Hell yeah. Um, we have a new format now, as we said. We're going to be doing a, a bi-weekly together, and every other week you're going to get a solo episode from Brando and a solo episode from me where one week you can hear Brandon talk about uh, all his video game adventures and his uh, journey into his uh, you know, video game timeline, and I'm going to do the same uh, because video games were very much an integral part of who I became as a nerd and comic book fan. Uh, that I all started in the video games. Oh uh, yeah, you know, I'm very interested to hear, you know, your journey, you know, 
along with that. And, you know, since you did that, you know, I was like, you know, I might as well just go right into that. And I was actually only going to do the ColecoVision and NES, and then I started blabbing on about the Super Nintendo. Like, well, I guess I'm just going to go right into this and make that part of Chapter 1, too. Uh, chapter 2 for me, when we get there, folks, which I is next week uh, me episode? I I believe so. Is I believe that on the schedule? So next week it'll be all me, folks. We'll, uh, we'll be discussing uh, Super Mario Kart and what I kind of associate that game with in a very dark part of my life uh, as a younger human being. So we'll get there. And uh, any comic book news that happens over this next week, you'll be hearing direct from the mouth of the man himself, me. Um, but until then, Brandon, I think we've wrapped this episode up, sir. I think so too, buddy. It's been fun. Absolutely, we don't uh, we don't get to blab on enough together, so it's always good to get in here and get a good chat going on. Oh hell yeah! So next time we hear Brandon, we'll be on episode twenty two when we're together. And uh, then he'll have a solo a solo cast. Uh, so until next time, I'm Nate Phillips. And I'm Brando. And we nailed that motherfucker that time. That's for damn sure, folks. This was Journey <laughs> into Comics. You guys have a great one. See you later.